Welcome to another edition of Talk Stocks. I'm your host, Keir Reynolds. And today I'm uh, uh, pleased to have uh, Sean Black, uh, Chief Investment Officer for Happy Belly Food Group back. Uh, it's our second time sort of speaking and it's uh, a little bit long overdue. Uh, I was supposed to do this update in uh, in July, but uh, had, had, a, had a kid and uh, got evacuated for some forest fires, so uh, a little bit delayed. H however, thanks uh, very much for fitting me in. I know you got a, a busy, busy time of it yourself. What's going on? Well, thanks, Kira, for having me, and uh, you know, congratulations on the uh, new arrival, new addition to the family. Um, Thank you. We've had a, uh, you know, what another? I was going to say a great year so far, and um, you know, business just keeps growing. You know, that's the uh, the name of the game. Right? Keep building the business. Uh, yes, uh, excellent. So, uh, I know you guys have been uh, really busy with like news releases, sort of since the beginning of the year. Quite a bit of activity. Maybe you wouldn't mind sort of like covering off uh, a couple of the sort of key milestones that you think are kind of important that uh, maybe for those that aren't sort of uh, um, keeping up as, as much on the day to day, maybe you could just sort of indicate a bit in terms of, uh, of what's been going on. Sure. Well, if you, um, take it right back. You know, the first piece here is uh, June this year was about a year that I've been with the company um, since I joined. And, you know, we just posted our Q2 financials. Uh, it was our fifth um, record quarter in a row. Um, you know, I think it's our seventh quarter of growth. Uh, we were lucky enough to continue to build uh, on the top line um, and also to date uh, have the lowest uh, burn rate for any quarter. So we've been able to, you know, improve margins, improve the bottom line and significantly grow our top line at the same time. Hey, we like the, we like the sound of that. Uh, you, you guys have been really busy in terms of, uh, you know, getting going on sort of franchising and and things of that um, nature. What sort of number now are you are you up to in terms of like area sort of development agreements that will play out over the next couple of years? What's the total number of locations for the company? Yeah, if you look at us as a uh, company, we launched the franchising program or our move into franchising in Q1 of 2023. I believe now we're at 160 units um, in the uh, pipeline across Canada. Our original goal, you know, was, you know, low end was 150 and top end line number for this year was to get to 200. Um, I think a lot of people before we started might have thought that was, you know, a little uh, aggressive or a little um, optimistic, a little <laughs> ambitious. Yeah. Um, but we're actually, you know, we passed our minimum threshold and our team's working hard to uh, try and exceed our our, uh, our top end goal. Um, so you know those are across Canada, across a few different brands. But um, we just announced our first actual franchise piece of real estate signed, and our first official agreement signed as well, which was a major milestone for us to uh, to do that. So there's an area called the Beaches in Toronto, um, prime lifestyle area that fits perfect for Heal Wellness, one of our brands, and uh, we announced that last week. And that's uh, the first uh, entry officially into franchising. Well, excellent! Uh, great, great spot for uh, for a future heel. Look forward to look forward to getting out there and trying it when uh, when it opens. Uh, great concept and uh, exciting uh, part of the city to 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 open and establish one of those. Um, so you've talked about some of the good things. Any sort of challenges that you faced in the first half of the year, uh, and any ways that you've had to sort of like address them. Um, yeah, you know what, we've had several challenges that, uh, come across the board and, you know, costs, costs just continue to rise, right? You know, the, uh, you know, the, the business itself of managing your costs, managing labor, uh, distribution, um, even one of the recent trips where I was planning on going to Kelowna and obviously, as you know, you know, you know, you get something like forest fires that completely change, you know, what you're going to do and how your travel goes. But, um, no, I don't think anything different than, every other brand is experiencing out there today. Uh, we're, we, the only barrier to growth today is really ourselves. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's really our, you know, number one challenge is just continue to execute. Uh, excellent. Um, so given your uh, company's, uh, you know, depth, uh, both in QSR and CPG, can you discuss a couple of your sort of maybe strategic focus for the remainder of the year? Like what are you most focused on? Yeah, sure. Um, we are heavily focused on QSR. 
you know, I mean, I think you uh, would see our last report. Um, the majority of our revenue now comes from QSR. Uh, that wasn't that way when we started. Um, and I expect that that number to accelerate. Um, we've launched, you know, we've done GVs. We've acquired 100% of brands. Um, for the first time for Happy Belly, we also announced uh, Joey Turks, our own entry into fast casual um, island grill and Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean Caribbean, I should say. Um, and that will open here in early Q4. Um, that was a strategic initiative internally. Uh, you know, we surveyed the market, looked at it to see if there was a brand leader out there today, someone that had, you know, first market, you know, first mover advantage in that category. Um, there are a few in the United States, but there was nobody in Canada that uh, we felt was a, a worthy partner um, that had, was aligned with our culture and our growth initiatives. So, you know, literally on that brand, we tapped into our own resource base. Instead of spending, you know, five, ten million dollars to go buy something, um, you know, we, we invest one hundred and fifty to two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars and we go out and launch our own brand, be a good a material win for our shareholders. Um, and we own 100 percent of it so again we said from the start if we can't find good partners in a category that we want to be in we believe is an emerging category then we'll just do it ourselves so that's one of the brands uh, that was a it's, it's technically an organic growth but it adds to our portfolio very strategic on a real estate side um, and it doesn't touch any of the organic growth we have coming with our existing brands so like fully like internally incubated uh Sharehold, um, existing shareholders of the company benefit from uh, from you know your guys' uh, experience in the in the category, and now you guys own a hundred percent of uh, of, a, of a brand that you can continue to open corporate locations and or look to franchise in the future. Is that about exactly. right? Yeah, that was a very strategic part in ourselves. We literally, you know, somewhere you know you can buy stuff for two million, five million, ten million. Um, we we passed on them and we went and did our own. Uh, we feel we can do it better and we can grow it faster. And with uh, full control of the brand, uh, we'll be able to dictate the the pace of uh, of the rollout. So we brought on a great uh, operator, uh, incredible chef. Worked with the team, uh, Alex and myself and Sean and everyone here. We pushed forward on it, um, and you know we're very excited to show everyone what we believe is the mucho burrito of uh, Caribbean fare that'll launch here in early Q4. Hey, excellent. Really looking forward to that. And uh, I think I messaged you on the day when the news came out. I thought it was a phenomenal uh, opportunity. Um, so just a little bit more on sort of QSR. There's a couple of different business models, and obviously you're very experienced in, in both of them. Uh, I, I guess two business models that I'm kind of familiar with, and maybe there's maybe there's more that you can educate us on here today. Uh, but there's sort of like the corporate owned where you as a company, you know, have to go and incur all the expense, have to go and identify the staff um, to, to run all the operations. Um, and then as a result, you either get to consolidate all the revenue and also deal with any um, issues in terms of uh, in terms of uh, burn and, and, uh, and, and brands that don't work. So there's that model. And then the other model that I'm kind of familiar with would be more on the franchise where um, you can go out and sort of um, um, sell the franchising rights, um, as to have somebody else set up the, the location, the facility, operate it, and then obviously the franchisor um, uh, will receive sort of a royalty or basically stream of revenue on an ongoing basis. Um, the risk there is that that revenue goes to zero if the group is not able to perform. Um, out of those sort, sort of two business models, uh, which is sort of happy belly. It sounds like, you know, in, in reading, it looks like it's a bit of both. Maybe you could talk about both of those business models and kind of where your thinking is in terms of how happy belly would be moving forward. Sure. Um, if you look, you know, in, in, in our history, uh, in our career, um, first time around with Extreme Pita and Mucho Burrito, it was 99% franchised. Um, and if you had asked me back then, I would have told you I thought that was the only way to grow. That was where our discipline was. That's where we gained our experience. Um, then we had the opportunity to uh, be partners and grow Burgers Priest and Fresh, uh, the plant-based chain of Toronto, and they were 100% corporate. So that was a real, uh, again, steep learning curve. Um, you know, it, it's a very different business. Uh, one side, uh, the corporate side is very capital intensive. 
And if you look at the other side, the franchise side, Asset Light, um, once you have the systems and the tools in place, it's very, it's very non-capital intensive. Margins are high. Um, you make a significantly less amount of revenue. But, you know, when you run a business and you run a corporate store, you might run 10, 15% bottom line uh, on every dollar that comes through the cash register. On the franchise royalty side, you can run somewhere between 50 and 90% margin on that revenue. So, right. um, and with it being CapEx light, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a very profitable business. Um, as long as you make money and your franchisees are making money, it's an incredible way to, uh, to grow and scale a brand. Best examples I can give you in, in my days were Mucho Burrito was 100% franchise and Chipotle was 100% corporate. Um, so they, they operated, we both grew in the, you know, in the market and, you know, a lot of people that would have probably bought a Chipotle end up buying a Mucho Burrito because they, you know, it's the one they could access. They could bring it to their local community. Um, uh, first we were, we were, one thing we did is we had first mover advantage. You know, we got it to, you know, 50 to even say 85 stores, uh, before Chipotle even even entered Canada. So if you look at the same model that we're currently working with today, um, if you look at Cava out of the United States, you know, they've raised about a billion dollars now of mark of capital and they're at 300 restaurants. Well, cause it, it costs them two and a half to $3 million minimum per restaurant to open up. So for us, uh, with Cava, if you look, we acquired 50% of the brand for about $125,000 of stock. And we're already, that's, sorry, sorry, that's P- Piro you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, Pyro, yeah. And um, in where, you know, so it's, let's say our CapEx investment in that is $250,000. Right. So you're looking at, two, you know, and it's got three stores today. And we're in the process of scaling that brand. Um, it's already profitable and there's no heavy CapEx required to, to go forward. Um, Kava is at a billion dollars of, of raised capital so far. And um, there are 300 stores. So it's just, a, it's a very different model. Restaurants, like I said, 10, 15% right. margin. On every dollar, royalty every dollar in somewhere between fifty and eighty five percent, typically. So, uh, Cava and uh, Chipotle would be, you know, prime examples of like the sort of one hundred percent corporate owned strategy. Yes, uh, where it's definitely asset heavy, uh, huge, you know, huge uh, sums of capital needed to move the businesses forward. Can be h- highly risky because you're kind of all in on one. You know, it's hard hard to hard to do more than one brand uh, successfully when you're sort of doing that. And then, uh, what what would be some? Uh, uh, do you have a couple of comparables, sort of more mature uh, companies that would be sort of on the franchise side that maybe people should look at? Yeah, if you if you look um, in the United States, uh, there's been you know several um, brands that have competed, but a lot of them regionally. You know, they can in the United States, you can have fifty or hundred stores, and you may never have heard of them before. Like early right. on, you know, Qdoba was a, an excellent competitor, and it was acquired for a ton of money um, along the way. Um, and you know, at the same side, you go on the the other franchise side. If you look outside of them, you know, Jimmy John's has been a great competitor. You know, Jimmy John's was sold recently, all franchise for about three billion dollars. So you know, I, I watched the CEO of Jimmy John speak about it the other day, and he goes, "Yeah, okay, we're the number two sandwich category in the ca- sandwich category. Subway's number one." but we still sold it for $3 billion. You know what I mean? So Excellent. Yeah, so we, we don't need to be that number one uh, in, in the world uh, with Pyro, uh, with Joey Turks, uh, with Heal, but we would like to be number one or number two in, in Canada. And um, typically in that category, the number one and number two of each control about 60% of the market. So if you can control 60% of a category, I think you'll do just fine. Excellent. And just for those that aren't as uh, well versed, could you just talk about the brands on the QSR side that you've got? Uh, yeah, which sure. ones you sort of own uh, kind of 100% of, and then others where, where, you know, what the ownership sort of situation looks like? Sure. Um, the first brand we did a deal with, uh, we did them in did that deal in Q2 of 2022, was Heal Wellness, a uh, smoothie bowl uh, concept out of Hamilton. Um, we are all, it was all corporate source. Uh, we've now got that to six open. Um, those six corporately owned stores, six corporately owned stores. Uh, we just and you, and you own a hundred percent of the brand. We own 50% of that brand. Um, okay. and we have a call option, um, to buy the remainder, the remaining 50. Um, it's at, it's at our uh, discretion. And, Great. um, 
if you look at that brand today, uh, it is real, you know no long term debt, um, very cash flow positive. Uh, six stores open. Uh, we just announced and signed our first uh, franchise agreement, uh, first franchisee for Toronto. Um, I just came back from Western Canada and Ontario, We've been touring with potential franchisees. So we expect to accelerate, accelerate the growth of, of Heal. Um, next year, we're targeting you know somewhere between 12 and 20 stores to open um, in 2024. So internally, that's our own our own budget for it. So we went from two stores to to six stores in one in the first 12 months. Second 12 months, we think we'll take it from six to somewhere between 12 and 20 stores. Wow, that's excellent. All right. Yeah. So that's uh, that's Heal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and can you sort of walk, walk us through the, the other brands? Yeah. So the next uh, deal we did on the QSR side is we uh, acquired a brand at a Bronson called Let Us Love. Um, we took that brand over. It was marginally profitable when we bought it. You know, it did have some profit in it. Uh, since then, uh, we've greatly accelerated the profitability of that brand. It's very cash flow positive. Um, and we've done a deal now for 20 more of them in Ontario. Uh, we're active in offer to leases uh, across the GTA for new locations. Um, working on Ottawa as well. Um, so we, we now expect to accelerate it. Uh, we own 100% of that brand. And, you know, so every dollar coming in is very meaningful on it. And so with 20, you know, deals done through an area development program, uh, it's asset light for us. Uh, we don't anticipate um, having to invest much more in it. If it is, it'd just be a reinvestment of profits uh, because now that brand is actually, you know, able to do distributions and, and uh, kick back to the parent company, which is a beautiful thing. Great. So yeah. that's Let Us Love. That's right. And, and then... Um, the next one we did was uh, was Pyro. Um, George, great gentleman. Um, I met him when he first had one store. Uh, brand wasn't ready for us. Um, he got it to three. Spoke to him again. Um, had a great opportunity there. He has a Baton Rouge background, so he's you know a very experienced operator, but needed help with scaling, um, bringing it to a, a, across Canada. So um, we did a fifty fifty deal with George on that deal. Uh, we have the option to buy the remainder, uh, remaining 50%. Um, and we are in active lease negotiations and franchise agreement process across Canada with multiple candidates. And uh, I think imminently people will start to see us uh, announce that rollout across Canada. And again, we're going for first mover advantage, uh, tying up the real estate, getting the early franchisees that are good ones. I'm going back to the um, to the team and back to the the well here on some of my great operators and guys I've worked with in the past um, to get scale quickly. And, you know, we want to be the leading fast casual Greek and Mediterranean for on the healthy premium side um, across Canada. And so that would be playing kind of in the CAVA type territory. They're yeah. obviously pretty well known uh, group with their IPO and and what's been going on. In the U.S., uh, they're primarily kind of focused in that market. So th- this would be sort of your spin on that kind of uh, cuisine. This is our, our a direct shot at you know what Cabo was doing. We, you know, we 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 targeted this brand uh, with an idea that you know just like we Mucho Burrito was to Chipotle, uh, Cava, right. Cava is to um, sorry Pyro is to Cava, and but we're doing it asset light franchising across Canada. Um, and that is a key piece that'll help us scale quickly. Um, you know, before Cava enters the market, we would like to, you know, get our first 50 or 100 stores uh, out there. I believe we already have uh, 80 done in area development. And, you know, we would like to start seeing those uh, start to open. And, and I realize it, like a lot of people have been waiting, you know, and I've, I've received the question saying, okay, you signed area development agreements. When the store is going to start to open? When are franchisees going to start to sure. Well, last week was our first one, and uh, we plan right. to keep, we plan to keep the news flow going with uh, a lot of announcements on uh, new openings. Great. Well, it's a real business. It takes time. It's not like they're going to get put up like uh, like you you put up a tent for the weekend to go camping. It's going to take <laughs> yeah. some time to find the right operator. You know, the right franchise franchise yeah. the right the right uh, the right location. Uh, they all have to be built, so uh, people do have to be a bit patient on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I guess the important thing is that, um, you know, you're going back to the well uh, with some of your contacts, 
Mucho Burrito, if I'm not mistaken, you got it up to how many? Four, 400 plus sort of locations? The combination of the, of the two brands, yeah, it was about, uh, about 400 stores. But, you know, Mucho, you know, was a very strong performer. It was a market leader in right. the Mexican. And so we learned a lot, you know, and even in my time at MTY, uh, you learn a lot about the real estate. You learn a lot about the development programs that work, what ones don't work, what's, what's in the best interest of franchisees. Um, so, yeah, we're deploying those now uh aggressively across canada you know we're being disciplined that the numbers are right we won't overpay we're not overpaying for the rents we're not you know taking franchisees that aren't qualified uh right we're, we're being picky and you know uh very picky when it comes to real estate and franchisees but knowing knowing what we know we're uh we definitely have our foot on the gas hey excellent and then uh i guess uh we can't forget uh, the last uh, QSR brand would be your your newest, uh, the Joey Turks. Is that correct? It is. Yeah, Joey Turks. Uh, th this is a passion project. Um, I think there's some you know some great food out there. Um, very much like when we saw Mucho Burrito, everyone would say, "Oh, I know this this I got this great little Mexican spot in my neighborhood," but nobody knows of a brand, a trusted brand in fresh Mexican back then across Canada that everybody frequented. You could ask someone in BC to you know, Halifax and not, you never hear the same name twice. So right. um, this is our answer to all the little independents and, you know, the little guys that are out there that run a great business and great food, but it's, it'll never scale and never be a national brand. So we went fast casual again, just like Mucho Burrito. Um, and we put together a platform in, uh, in Caribbean and, you know, from an Island grill standpoint, cause it's got some influence from a few different islands that we think is phenomenal. I think the food's excellent. Um, so I'm very excited to, you know, kind of pull the curtain up and uh, let people see it in October. Uh, it's our intent to open. And um, I think people are very excited. I've had calls, you know, for several of the brands across the market. But yes, from an investor standpoint and from a potential franchisee standpoint, uh, Joey Turk certainly um, had my phone busy when it uh, was announced. Great. Well, it seems like a category that everybody's got like a favorite spot. But again, if you go across the country, um, everybody's going to have a different one. Yeah. You don't ever see it uh, really uh, get, you know, it's not one of those things. You're at a, uh, you know, an airport and you go to the food court. It's not really represented. You go to a mall, you go to a food court. It's not represented. You go to a shopping plaza where there's a lot of QSR tends not to be very well represented. So it looks like a great category that, um, you know, some, yeah. uh, some good the biggest white state, in the uh, country. you know, some good open ice there for for you to uh, uh, to bring exactly. uh, bring some cuisine like that uh, to uh, to the forefront. Recognized and trusted uh, Caribbean or Island Grill is just not represented in Canada. Some of the biggest landlords in the country have called and said, "Sean, is this going to be anything like Mujo or what I was doing before?" And the answer is yes. And they're like, "Well, we'd like to offer you a spot." So we're active discussions on real estate that'll be you know for uh, subsequent locations that would open in 2024 that could be very meaningful, high profile, great real estate. Um, so we're just, you know, doing our homework on the real estate and, uh, and the operations. And we'll probably do more corporate as well as franchise. We'll probably grow them in parallel paths. Um, but, you know, yes, we're, we believe there's significant open ice in this category. Underrepresented to your exactly what you said, just like Mexican food was, you know, before we launched Witcher Burrito. And I, I get it. Like, and if, you know, if I was talking to people and I asked people, five people in a row, and they all gave me the same answer of where the best place to go was from across Canada, I probably wouldn't enter that category. I'd probably look at a different category because then I believe that, you know, it's saturated. So I'd go after something that isn't well represented and five people can't answer me the same, same answer. Probably more interesting to me uh, as a category for expansion, especially organic. If, if there is one that's great and it's still small and everybody gives me the same answer, I'm going to go try and buy it. And I'll, I'll buy the leader, but if there isn't a leader, um, you know, I, we had to we had to uh, get Alex and the team to dust off the aprons and get back in the kitchen and uh, work on the food and deliver something that we can be proud of. Uh, e excellent. So it sounds like uh, I guess in whole you've got kind of a bit of a hybrid business model, asset light where uh, in, in you know uh, franchise as well as doing some corporate own for some of the brands where maybe you still need to incubate. And develop out sort of the brand identity and the menu, and and sort of get get some success under your belt before you can really kind of franchise it out. Is that yeah, sort of yeah, what I'm hearing? Right. Um, a lot of times, you know, people want to, you know, we, we like proof of concept, right? So I'd rather if if it doesn't exist and I can't find it, 
then I'd rather open it ourselves and get the proof of concept before we start franchising it. So that's sort of what we've done in some of them. And some of them, you know, you want to, sometimes you want to put a beachhead in a market to launch, um, you know, then we'll do that as well. But yes, when the, when the, when the unit economic model is really strong in a brand, we have no, you know, if we find a great piece of real estate, we don't have a franchisee for it, then I'd prefer us open it up ourselves, put our own capital at risk uh, versus just passing on the site. So yes, and then maybe over time we'll refranchise the site. Um, but I typically won't pass up on a home on a piece of real estate because I don't have a franchisee. And sometimes we will do a JV. We've even looked recently at a few more opportunities in the United States um, for us to expand potentially one of our brands. And maybe we will co-invest. Maybe we will be a partner with somebody in the United States. If the right partner comes to us and says, hey, I'd love to bring your brand, but you know, would you co-invest or would you do something with us? We'll, we'll have those discussions. And I think uh, over time, some of our brands will be ready for U.S. entry. Uh, e excellent. Uh, so right now, 100% of locations based in Canada, but you're also looking a bit south of the border, uh, potentially in the right for the right, uh, I guess, in the right deal. Yeah, exactly. And uh, for M&A, we'll look at the United States and also for our own brands for organic growth. Uh, you know, we get a lot of inbound calls for M&A out of the United States, and it's just about the right deal, the right brand that we feel, you know, maybe we can take it and also bring it to Canada and leverage our resources here. Um, and maybe we use kind of like what MTY did when they acquired us. They used our platform in the United States because we had North, I think, north of 50 stores at the time. They used our platform to leverage, you know, Thai Express and other brands and bring them into the United States. So um, if I could ever access the right platform and the right team and the right brand and then use, use that as our, you know, kind of our launching pad for our other brands in the United States, certainly we'd look at it. But there's been no shortage of U.S. interest uh, from some of our brands. Um, excellent. Um, good to hear. Just a little bit, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the whole franchising. So, you you know, you're, n you know, no stranger to the model. Um, for, for a group like uh, like a Pyro or a Lettuce Love um, or even Heal, uh, where you're getting into franchising and you've signed some big development deals. Um, is that somebody internally with uh, with your group at Happy Belly that is helping to sort of systematize and really set that up so it can yeah. be a franchisable business model? Yeah, two things. You know, you go and you, you, we take a couple steps back. You know, we get, you know, uh, really, you know, probably the top, you know, franchise lawyer in the, in the country comes in, you know, puts the paperwork in place, the documentation, franchise agreements, disclosure documents, all the stuff we need. And then uh, we have a few people on our team from marketing to training and operations manuals and some of that that they put in place. And then we also have one of the gentlemen on our team that um, helps the new brands uh, put some of those the pieces in place, make sure they're operationally ready. That's why typically after we do a deal, we take about three to six months of working on the brand and really dialing it in, getting the unit economic model even stronger, the purchasing, the tech stack, get it ready. So what sort of financial uh, metrics are you guys most focused on for the second half of the year? Um, you know, really the, the, the business has been, you know, consistent delivering the growth on the top line. And uh, we've got the burn now down to about just around 200000 a quarter. Um, and we had one one uh, item last quarter that was our largest single uh, loss, uh, contributor to the loss. And that was a one-time event. So we don't anticipate that being uh, on there. So, you know, significant improvement on our bottom line for Q3 uh, is important. Um, and we look to deliver, you know, on the top line as well as we've, uh, we've added units and, you know, our brands are, uh, our brands are performing on both sides, QSR and CPG. Uh, great. Um, how are you ensuring the, uh, the company remains fiscally responsible while also continuing to pursue growth and expansion? How do you kind of, how do you kind of do those? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting one. I think that's probably a number one challenge for anybody that wants to be considered a growth company, you know what I mean? Is to how do you do that and not, you know, blow up your cap table or, um, you know, spend every penny that comes in the door. Um, and for us, um, you know, Sean and I uh, work with our accounting team and, you know, the, you know, guys in the finance and everybody, every single day with the brands, we're in the restaurants, we're talking to the brands. Um, we're literally working as a team to, you know, drive efficiency um, and, and improve margins. And we were very lucky to do that again in Q2. And we continue to get better at it. We don't, we don't ever want to say we're the best. 
but we continue to get better and improve. And I think so far in Q3, you know, we're going to show that that's working. And as well with more organic growth coming, um, I think that will, you know, accelerate us in 2024. Can't say we'll always deliver a, you know, a record quarter, but we want to deliver improvement and something that everybody can look forward and say, okay, well, they got more units opening, more, you know, more restaurants coming. So their, their royalty revenue naturally is going to go up. And that's what we're going to do. Um, if you look at the early days with MTY, like they were flatline forever. You know what I mean? Like they were, you know, it took them, I'm going to say 20 years before they even went public. And then, you know, where they were working on the business. Well, I'd say, you know, we're, you know, I've been here a year and in a year we've accumulated more brands than they had at that time. And we've delivered significantly more growth. Um, so um, I just think we just got to be patient, stay disciplined and focus on that bottom line of the business. We're not here to win headlines and say, oh, we know we have lots of revenue, but we lost our shirts like a lot of other, you know, small micro caps out there do. Um, right. I, I want to say, you know, we're profitable, cat flow positive, we're mindful of investor um, capital and, and our share structure because the way our deal is structured, um, the board and our team, we don't make money like across the board. We're not making real money until we get this thing to $2. So, you know, we're very mindful of the cap table, how we bring in money, uh, which we've been very fortunate to do, bring in strategic capital, um, you know, as well as, you know, friends and family uh, who have all invested in this business to get this to the finish line. Uh, great. Well, what uh, for those of you who don't know, you're uh, you're pretty uh, sort of active sort of um, in, in communicating with shareholders. Uh, I would say you're probably... I know you're busy. I, I don't know where, when you sleep, but you certainly have lots of time for people that are shareholders of the company and take time to kind of answer questions, which I think is very important. And, you know, I think you go way above and beyond what a lot of companies have, um, sort of management do. So, so good on you. Um, in terms of that, you've kind of used a few times things like, you know, apparently sort of like uh, boring or, um, you know, um, you know, just quarter over quarter sort of growth. Um, you know, uh, you've brought up sort of having to look at like MTY, um, you know, that was sort of uh, a slow and steady sort of wins the race uh, sort of stock. You know, that's something where you can go back and look at the stock chart, you know, about 20 years ago. And, and uh, you know, uh, so that was definitely took a long time to sort of develop. Um, I imagine you're sort of using some of those words intentionally. Is that to sort of attract the right type of uh, investor, the right type of shareholder uh, who's not looking for like a quick quick flip, but is uh, looking to stay on board and be sort of a, a long-term shareholder to give you the runway to build a, a business, which again, has some reality to it. it it's got, it takes time to, uh, <laughs> there is to some, reality to some it. of these things. So is some of that done by design? Yeah, you're hundred percent right. There is some reality to what I'm saying. You know what I mean, and, uh, 100% it is intentional because um, I want to set the expectations. I don't want to be one of those other, you know, fake executives that come out and blow smoke up everybody to, you know, just to move the needle and then drop a terrible financing on their head um, and justify it that uh, I just created all these bag holders. I spent $1.5 or $2 million on promo. Yeah, the promo guys, you know, made a ton of money as far as, or the guys that are friends of them, so they got the jump on it. And now you've created all these bag holders and this tax loss selling that's going to get crushed them at the end of the year. Well, we're literally – being on the discipline side, we are being disciplined in our messaging as well. Uh, we're trying to create a long-term compounder here with this business. And that's exactly what MTY did. They used their free cash flow. Every penny that came in the dollar, when, when it came, came in the door, went back out in an M&A and they continued to accelerate. Well, we're doing it as well, but we are more so using it for organic growth than just M&A. Uh, we do believe M&A will be a part of our story. Uh, in 2024 and 2023, I believe there's lots of opportunity for us to, to add significant M&A to our business, our core business today, um, especially on the on the QSR side. Um, but w every dollar that we have in the bank today, and we're very fortunate to have you know plenty of money in the bank, um, there's lots of runway on the business, um, is being used for growth, right? Because that is the quickest path for us to get to profitability, not necessarily move our share price. But it is the quickest path to profitability is driving organic growth. And that's where our money is being spent. So I don't have the extra two, three, four million dollars to spend in promo and, you know, and drive it, you know, up or, sure. 
maybe we would have considered it, you know what I mean? But it's the reality of our business is for the long-term people that we're trying to do and, you know, and the time that we've taken to clean up the float, um, we are like deathly allergic to, as you, you know, uh, to doing the other way because that could kill us. Right. And that would sure. put us out of business if we blow our money on uh, promotion, banking right. on a, ho- a hopeful raise, like we can raise money. So I don't need the share price to go up. I, we last raise was done in a convertible at 30 cents and, you know, we're buying in the float. So, the only purpose that I can see today um, is to try and drive the stock up so that I can get, you know, if I'm going to issue paper to an M&A deal so it gets it up at a higher price or I'm trying to raise money. Other than that, I don't know, like, why else we would just try and move the share price. I'd rather move the bottom line of the business than sure. I move the share price. Um, that that makes sense uh, to to a degree. I, I guess uh, re- in a fairly recent news release a couple months ago, there was some mention about, um seeking uh, approval to reduce the conversion price for last year's convertible debenture yes You're supposed to convert uh, i think there's about a year left on it i uh, converted 25 cents you're looking to reduce it to 20. um is that sort of being done based upon sort of market conditions uh, and do you expect most of those shareholders to convert yeah like we're very fortunate that um a big portion portion of that conversion was done through family friends um and some very strategic shareholders um so two things we wanted to do in there we want to provide a return for those investors that did support us early when we were really early on this journey i think when we first started talking about doing that internally we were at like seven or eight cents um we wanted to raise money and we're going to try and raise it at 20 cents and i'll be honest a few people did laugh at us um because we the story wasn't out there we hadn't delivered the record numbers and stuff yet and people were like giving you money at 20 cents like there's no way banks literally giggled at a conversion at 20. so to reward properly across the board and with you know the macro out there the way it is we it, the the year two of that conversion was supposed to go to 25 cents we just left it at the original price of 20. so there's actually like you know no impact to it today um but the that i think that's end of june uh is when that yes. conversion is so there's about a year left uh just just a little less than a year uh, on that conversion, and uh, we do believe that uh, the majority of that will convert uh, at that time. And, and that was for how much? About a million dollars, was it? Two million. Two million. Okay. Two million. Yeah, and we still have about you know a million four, a million five in the bank, and we have profitable businesses across the board. And those people are also getting paid, aren't they? Like uh, interest to sort of wait. That's right. Yeah, they got paid uh, on a quarterly basis. They get paid twelve percent of the month. Well, we'd certainly hope to see all of them convert then. Yes, and that's what we will see. Uh, we, we know where that money is, and uh, sure. we, we will look for that to uh, to convert uh, in 2024. Right. Yeah. So in terms of uh, some of your guys' own uh, uh, structure, you've got uh, like some uh, warrants uh, that obviously are based upon, um, you know, hitting certain uh, share price. Uh, sort of That's right. Yeah. Our, our, our internally, the board and the team, our, the way it works for us is um, we have about 27 million performance warrants, um, which if they hit the strike price, we have to cut a check for in total about $5.4 million into the company. So Alex, Mark, Kevin, myself, um, we would have to write the check for the 5.4. Um, but to earn those, we have to get the share price $2. So, you know, we got some work to do. Don't get me wrong. But a um, that is our, you know, our single, we have we all have a singular focus within the team and it's building the business. There's enough value there that people are willing to pay to all the share. You know, I mean, that's why we're here and we don't hide it. We actually purposely put it out there in the public domain. Um, and a lot of guys ask me, when you joined this company, why didn't you just take a whole bunch of free options and like set yourself up forever? Like you guys could have done it based on your track record. And enough of us have been burned by other, you know, BS CEOs um, that we wanted to do this old school. We wanted to build it based on profitability and give everyone a chance to participate. I knew about NTY. At, well, the first time I knew about it was 30. Right. Um, right. I knew about it at 70. I knew about it, but I never participated. Sure. So, well, I, I guess if you look at their, uh, uh, you know, stock performance over the years, um, you know, it went from like under a dollar to what, like sixty five dollars a share or something like that. Yeah, it was. They they went they went public at twenty cents, 
um, and their recent yeah. high was about seventy three dollars. Um, right. So it's been one of the best you know compounders in the history of the TSX. So right. um, there is a path there and, and a playbook that we can follow, and we certainly are for the most part. We're just sure. trying to deliver more organic growth. Right. Um, and so, and so if you look at if you look at theirs again, we you guys are different businesses, but the same sort of sector. If you look at their business um, and how their stock price performed, again, we don't, we don't, we're not building companies just for stock price performance. But um, it, you know, if you looked at that, it was sort of year over year, uh, kind, of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, doubling sort of effect. Um, if you look at, if you look at how they performed, which again, um, hey, there's nothing to sneeze at with that type of performance. Yeah. If we go back a year from when you guys were first getting started, you guys are up. Probably about you know just over double uh, kind of where you started. Um, so uh, would you say it's been uh, one year of success here based upon uh, the platform that you've had to inherit? Yeah, like you know uh, two things. Like yeah, we're up I think since January like sixty or seventy percent on our share price. Um, our revenue is up significantly. Our bottom line's improved. And uh, one key thing here is the we pull the numbers twice a year on our on our float and. You know, we are now, I think, about 30 or 31 shareholders own 50% of the float. Um, wow. And, I think, and I, you know, when we started, there was, a, uh, I think Sean would know the number better, but it's about, we had about 10,000 shareholders. Uh, we've now cut that down in half, uh, way less than half, I should say. Uh, I think we might be down to three, 4,000 shareholders. And we have, I think, about 150 shareholders now that control over 70 million shares. So, um and I'd say most of those 150 are on my f speed dial. So, you know, we're very connected. You talked about it earlier. Like I have all the time in the world for a little guy or a big guy that wants to call about, you know, the share or what we're doing. And a lot of them, I tell them like, you don't have to buy shares. They just wait. And if we execute, then, you know what I mean? Like, the, you know, then reward us. But until we until we earn your trust and respect, you know, no need to buy the shares. Just sit and watch. And sure. um, for the most part, I would say we have executed pretty well. I think we can always improve. But 31 shareholders, I believe it is, that control 50% of the float now. And, and of those 31, I know several of them that are actively buying them. And I know lots of I know shareholders that own between a million and seven million shares each, and they're actively buying the float. In that same time, Sean and his family have went from 2 million shares to 20 million shares, right? They're almost, they're roughly, wow. around, they're roughly around 20 million shares. So if you want to see a CEO and his family that's got, you know, skin in the game. I'd say he's got all his skin in the game. <laughs> like he's he's very committed to making this work, doing right by his family and his shareholders. Um, and we're doing the same. I've purchased, you know, I mean, a uh, stock in the float. I'll continue to buy, um, and we'll continue to build value. But the the key here: thirty one shareholders owning fifty percent of the float. That's a big difference from when I joined, and there was ten thousand shareholders. So the, we did have a, a real cleanup effort to do on the uh, on the cap structure of the company. Right. Now we have money in the bank and, you know, we've increased insider ownership, I think, from 2% to, I think with what's coming here, we're about 15% now. So, you know, I mean, we've, we've increased insider ownership dramatically. Uh, we're, we're soaking up the float. Way more work than I ever thought when we started. I underestimated actually how long it would take to clean up the float. My original investment in Happy Belly, well, back then it was called Plantico, uh, was at 20 cents. All of us put our own capital in. We put about $600,000 in. At twenty cents, um, we have warrants. You know, I mean, that'll come due next summer. Um, internally, we can easily exercise those and put more money in the company if we need to. Um, and I, d I didn't think it'd be traded this long down here. And you know, up but then I have some friends that bought at eight cents, ten cents, and bought a million shares. And uh, one lady, you know, called one of her brokers I know very well. She bought a million shares at ten cents. She's like, wow, she's ecstatic. She's up seventy percent this year in her money. Those are good. That's a, that's a pretty good feeling compared to the other way. We're not interested in creating bag orders. Well, that's great to hear. So I, I guess, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you and I have gone back and forth. I've needled you a little bit on some, <laughs> on some stuff. I got to say, I, I'm not a big fan of Friday news releases for good news, but you guys uh, do it like by design. What, what, what's the thinking there? Sometimes, believe it or not, um, it actually isn't within our, you know, like, you know, like that's when the news is coming out. We do try and put it out, you know, and not manipulate it. We try to put it out when it's ready. Sure. Um, so sometimes it does actually happen. 
And we're like, oh, God, people are going to think this is like totally on purpose. You know what I mean? And, and it's actually not always on purpose. Uh, sometimes if it is strategic, uh, because, yes, most companies put out, it's a quieter day, uh, going out on a Monday or Tuesday when all the big guys on the big boards put out typically all their news. You know, a small little company can get lost in the weeds, right? Like there's just a lot of noise out there. And a lot of people do expect bad news on Fridays or Friday post, you know, four o'clock. And, oh, my God, somebody just issued somebody on the company 10 million options. They paid out all their guys with. Yeah, not, yeah, not, not for you guys. Not, those are not your Friday news no, releases. No, exactly. Fridays are usually before open. But yeah. still, uh, still uh, I sometimes go, ah. Oh, well, on a Friday. You know what, <laughs> anyway, that's but at least okay. You read, it. you read it. You know what I mean? It didn't, you didn't. Oh, I missed it. I was so much other stuff going on yeah. on Monday that I didn't well, even know that it's you all over it. my. It's all over my Twitter feed because you do have some uh, some Twitter warriors uh, who uh, who make sure that uh, we can't uh, cannot see it. But a- anyway, that that's okay. So it's a little bit by design. So it's uh, so you can get a few more eyeballs on it, not get lost in the shuffle. Part of and it then is it's that. also sometimes, you know, just materially when the news, um, like when, when it has to be put out. Yeah, it is. And, you know, we'll, we'll try and mix in a few for you the rest of the year. I care that it's not on a Friday. Keep yourself, keep you interested. Okay. If that, if that's all there is to uh, complain about, then there's nothing to complain about. So yeah. um, it's just a minor nitpick. Uh, I sometimes just worry that uh, maybe they fall a bit flat because people are, uh, especially during the summer, they're checked out by the time Friday come comes anyways. Yeah. But anyway, that's all right. Um, good, thanks for answering that. Good and then point. I guess, uh, you, you know, in terms of like uh, valuation for the company, um, how, how are you sort of thinking the company's uh, value? Do you think it's fairly valued? Do you think it's undervalued? Uh, is this a stupid question to ask? No, you know, you know, I, I don't think it, it is. It's a, you know, it's, it's, it's always a tough question to answer, right? You know, for sure. Sure. It's yeah. curious, you know, I, I the beholder. Um, and, you know, I, all I can tell you from that standpoint is, um, you know, from 20 cents down, I've been actively buying. Um, and even post news, normally all you always notice after news releases, like I don't buy it in advance of the news release. I typically go in the store and, and if I possible and I'm allowed to, I buy post news releases to show, you know, I mean, my, my own support for what we're building. But, you know, I'd say if, if it was just on today's value, you could argue all day long whether we're overvalued or undervalued. Um, and it would be a good debate by some. And, but the sum of the parts, not everybody looks at that, right? The SOTP on this. And, you know, we have brands here that are creating real value, uh, generating revenue. Um, if you look at right. hist- history here, um, you know, some of the brands I've sold are, you know, able to be worth 50 to $100 million. And we now have, you know, four brands on the, on the QSR side and growing. Uh, ideally, uh, you know, and we got CPG brands. I think if we were to ever go to market at some point in time across the board and sell them, um, I think, you know, individually over time, we'd maybe worth more than our market cap. Um, I believe, you know, certain ones we have today that are already growing uh, based on their, their actual free cash flow that they produce uh, when you take out the pubco costs. Sure. Uh, some of the individual port goes or uh, portfolio companies are going to be worth way more than our market cap imminently. Um, so we're okay with that. Um, we'll buy back stock ourselves personally. Um, we will, you know, continue to educate the consumers, uh, the, from a customer standpoint, right to our retail investors or, you know, institutional investors, um, and keep building the business. And, you know, if, you know, uh, yes, you talk about social media and we do have a presence out there and, you know, because I don't think anybody can tell the story better than either Sean or myself. Uh, right. I think we're the best at community. Yeah, you guys do a great job. Fantastic and, job. We, but we're, yeah. we're, and we're not going to BS anybody. Like, there's no need to, right? It doesn't affect my life for one bit if the stock goes up or down or if any or not. You know, I mean, what does affect it though is the quarterly numbers. Um, I believe that it's completely within our control for the next one, two, three quarters, how, the organic growth and the inorganic growth that's coming. We do believe we will execute in opening more new organic units. I think we'll add more area development deals. I think we will uh, do more M and A. Um, and I have that capability with what's in front of us today there's no shortage of a pipeline of new stores coming or m a and ideally we'd like to get ourselves at least to 10 brands on the, on the qsr side and that's right. the goal yeah okay so you're going to get to 10 that's 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 my own number internally i want to get to 10 sure. brands and that we can actively show 10 emerging brands all opening units 
and you could do the math whether they all open two a year or they all open ten. But if, let's right. say you know, I mean, if you had you know MTY scale never came from any one individual brand. Sure. Today they're at you know seventy brands plus. If every for them if they all open up five, they open up three hundred and fifty restaurants a year at MTY. So right. if we have 10 emerging brands that across the portfolio, if they were all able to open up five, that would be 50 new units a year. Well, if we're able to deliver 50 organic units a year across the board, um, I think we could build this into a beast. Yes, that sounds like phenomenal growth. And MTY are up to, what, over 7,000 locations now, are they not? Over 7,000 locations. Uh, I actually personally believe they're very undervalued. They, they have a dividend. They produced last quarter, I think, about forty-five million in free cash flow. Um, you know, when you combine the debt plus the market cap, they're about two point five, two point six billion Canadian. They're worth about half of Cava, and they, you know, Cava doesn't have near that cash flow or the dividend. Um, so, you know, when I look at it that way, I think you know MTY is undervalued, but seven thousand restaurants, and you know, they'll probably produce two hundred, two hundred fifty million dollars in free cash flow, and uh, they pay a dividend. So. Right. I, I do call that boring. It is, you know what I mean? But um, Stanley, you know, I saw him cash out recently, another 40 or $50 million of the stock that he sold. So I think he's pretty, pretty okay. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, uh, obviously I'm uh, quite biased as a shareholder. Uh, so I certainly, uh, you know, uh, want the company to be, um, you know, growing and, and being and having you guys be rewarded for your hard efforts. Otherwise, at some point in time, I guess I would worry that hey, if it's not happening, that, you, you know, you're going to want to, you know, move on or take on other things um, that, that might be easier. Uh, and part of that, uh, when I talk about, you know, being rewarded is being rewarded with share price sort of growth, market yeah. cap growth. Um, so, you know, certainly um, you guys have been busy. You're very busy with a real business that takes a lot of time and energy. Um, also with your track record um, and the team, um, along with your own capital markets experience, you're, you know, not only an incredibly well-known QSR um, executive and, uh, you know, who's delivered, but you're also like very well known to a lot of individuals as a, uh, as a, a great check writer and a big time investor sort of in the small cap world. So to kind of cross over a little bit into, you know, not not only being a great operator, but a great investor, um, you, you could probably complete, you know, a much bigger raise uh, and further de-risk the business. Um, have you not considered uh, maybe trying to do so? Or is that just like just a waste of time? Um, you know, twofold. Uh, as you know, like capital is expensive right now, right? And uh, And, you know, so what we've tried to do is take in the money as, as needed. Uh, we've been very fortunate. We have a few people around us that'll, that have funded us and have offered to continue to fund us if, if we need it. Um, you know, we've had some of those same people go in and buy a million, two million, three million shares alongside writing the check um, because they're, you know, they're in it for, you know, for the long term play. Um, so, yes, we've had offers come forward, you know, for larger amounts. Um, we've even looked at debt facilities uh, that we could use from an acquisition line. Uh, we've looked at all opportunities that are out there. I just need the right M&A or the right pieces because if I'm already funded for the next, you know, 6, 12, 18 months, and, we, and you know, we don't want to carry the extra burden of, you know, from a debt standpoint. Um, sure. Unless I can deploy the capital into a really good asset. If there's something really good out there to buy, I'll start knocking the door on the doors of the bankers and, and, and working to raise the capital. But do I want to dilute at 15 or 20 cents? No. Um, not when we have money in the bank. And all of our assets are actively growing. I'd rather, you know, get into 2024, keep improving the numbers. Um, if we need to raise another 200,000, 500,000, or a million, well, we got options, you know, I mean, or warrants that can come in um, we, that are, you know, internally held by us. So we could easily bring in more money. And I do believe we have the ability to access debt um, for the right MA. I believe there are banks out there today. Um, there was some that have been involved right. in, you know, MTY, some that were involved in recipe. Um, that are no recipe wet private. So now there's a lot of extra money that's sitting out in the space. Um, I think as we keep getting bigger, we'll become a little more, um, I'm going to say, you know, proven and de-risked that I think even, you know, bigger opportunities will come our way. MTY now has about a $900 million credit facility. Um, when they first started, I bet you Stanley would have had a hard time raising, you know, 900000 let alone $900 million. Great. Yeah. <laughs> 
things have changed for sure for for him and that group. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. So we're very fortunate. So, so maybe, maybe some... on that note, you you mentioned you think they're sort of undervalued. It maybe seems that you know U.S. Uh, sort of listed companies, U.S. investors and capital groups maybe understand the the QSR sector maybe a little bit better than than sort of uh, Canada. Um, so do you think that if MTY ever decided to, you know, go list, I think they've sort of talked a bit about it, if they've ever ever decided to list over there, that they uh, might get a better valuation? I, I think they're way undervalued, um, trading on the Canadian exchange. Um, I, with that kind of free cash flow, let's say they get to $200, $250 million in free cash flow. Um, now 70% of their revenue comes from the United States, which is part of the reason why I believe there was a bigger opportunity for Happy Belly in Canada than there was five, 10 years ago ever. Um, I think with 70% of their revenue coming from the U S um, they should be listed on, you know, at least dual listed, if not, you know, solely listed, uh, you got companies with a fraction of their revenue, no free cash flow, tons of debt trading at way higher valuations than them. Um, I've mentioned it to them multiple times. If I was them, you know, but they're, they, you know, they've been so far pretty comfortable being a small, you know, shop out of, you know, out of Montreal and Laval, you know, they kind of, you know, keep to themselves. And um, I, my guess is if they had a, you know, high profile, you know, U.S. person on their board and they went and made a major, you know, push to the U.S. listing, they would experience a significant amount more institutional investors. Um, new money would come to the table. They wouldn't trade uh, where they are today. But is that I, uh, is that all something that uh, Happy Belly should uh, have their eye on? Is that ever if it became right? If it became where that's where our capital was coming from or that's where our M&A growth was coming from, for sure, it would be something that uh, I would recommend uh, the team entertain. But, you know, I'm, I'm just happy that for right now we're able to build our base, you know, the, the, where, where we have the reputation and we have the, the relationships with other franchisors that are willing to do deals with us. Um, and I'm happy that, you know, the big deals are, you know, $50 million, $100 million deals um are being soaked up by MTY and, and other bigger companies because they leave the small ones to us, right? So we're able to, you know, write our own ticket a little more, do deals that I think are a little more shareholder friendly um with the deals that are in front of us based on the size, the deal and the space we're playing in. Uh I'm glad they're not in our market at the moment. They're fishing in a different pond. Right. Okay. Well that's great. Thanks for covering that. Um in terms of uh like like, what does a typical day look like for you, uh, like right now? <laughs> can you, you like, know, uh, I can imagine you guys are busy with all the brands and, um, you know, uh, obviously following some of your social media, you're, you're having to sort of uh, do the gut check, you call it, where yeah. you know, try try new uh, new things. But what does a typical day look like? Uh, that's, a, that's a good one. You know, I mean, uh, you, you, you know, I read a lot. Uh, I am usually up pretty early and up pretty late. Um, and Usually I try, you know, five to seven days a week. I'm in at one restaurant or another. Um, sometimes, you know, two meals a day or so, you know, at least one. Uh, Monday, Tuesdays are big day for meetings. You know, we do a review on our, all the brands and our team together. Um, so I don't, it's Monday or Tuesday, I don't as often get into a restaurant um, that I, as I'd like. But, uh, you know, the rest of the week, it's typically a uh, uh, a busy day between, you know, probably right now, I'm going to say 75% of my time is spent on real estate, um, securing the sites for the brands across the country. I'm personally putting my finger, you know, my, my own uh, fingerprint on each of the brands and the rollout strategy. Um, so that's why I was just in Alberta and BC and stuff like that, because we're very active in the real estate search in those markets. We've got some significant unit uh, commitments out there. So now it's about rubber meeting the road and signing the real estate and signing the franchisees. So probably 75% real estate. Uh, right now, 25% M&A, looking at the other deals that are out there, because right now we've been getting anywhere from two to five inbound calls a week on M&A. So sometimes, yeah, you're going to go check out the food, check out the sector, um, look at the, you know, talk, meet the founders and see whether, you know, it's worth, they're worthy of a, a JV with us, uh, an opportunity with next level partners, or even a full opportunity that's out there. And um, we have an active pipeline. Then there's some, some yeah, of maybe uh, you just brought it up. Maybe you could uh, talk just uh, briefly here on Next Level Partners, what it's all about. Yeah, Next Level Partners was uh, another way to leverage the, the bench strength we have. Um, you get a lot of brands that either meet one of two criteria. Um, they're just not ready for us yet. They're just, you know, hey, I don't want to sell. I don't want to do anything. I'd love to access your guys' help. 
but I don't want to give up, you know, a whole bunch of equity today. Okay, well, then you, you know, you have to either pay us with equity or pay us with a check, you know, I mean, to get us there. So uh, some of them do decide to pay us with a check um, and get help for 6, 12, 18, 24 months, depending on the agreement. Typically about, you know, they're usually 6 to 12 month agreements uh, where they'll write us a check to leverage our team. So we'll come in, provide them support, give them guidance, um, help them with a strategy um, and get them up and running or accelerate them or sometimes help them with some adversity they're facing. Um, and for that, they pay us. And over time here, we think that'll become, you know, while we're building our brands, it provides a immediate um, injection of cash flow um, that can be pretty meaningful to Happy Belly while we're still building our own brands. So that's one option. But then the other option is um, some of these brands, you know, we may work with them for six, 12 months and kind of like, you know, dating. And we may get to, you know, peek under the hood a little bit, work with the management, and we may say, okay, now you're ready. You know, six, 12 months out, now they've got proof of concept and they're, they're a little further along. Their P&L is, you know, cleaned up. And it's, it's a deal that now we can all of a sudden do where before, if they're losing money and they, you know, they don't have a path forward or something like that, like we won't do it at EM&A. So sometimes it's that way. We're doing it also to work together. Um, they pay us. We work alongside them. And then, you know, six, 12 months down the road, we may decide to, you know, continue the relationship uh, on an advisor role. And we may say, you know what, maybe now is the time we're going to buy you or we're going to JV with you. So um, it is another revenue stream that we've entered into. And we do expect to expand that revenue stream here uh, in Q4. Great. Um, well, hey, I've taken a lot of your time. Uh, any sort of closing remarks or uh, anything that uh, we didn't touch on you'd like to, to kind of touch on? No, I think that, you know, I think we, we sort of touched on it. You know, I mean, yes, we, you, to your point, we are significantly uh, increasing our exposure in QSR. Uh, all of our brands are. Right. Active, active I love growing. it. Yeah. I know we're actively growing. Uh, we do anticipate adding to the portfolio. Uh, we have an appetite to, to add brands and um, deliver significant growth that is forecastable. So I think we can, we'll become more predictable with our growth uh, because, as you mentioned, you know, some of these deals, when you sign one, it may take three once the location signed. It may take three to six months to open it. Well, we'll start to be able to forecast our growth uh, for 2024 even more on the QSR side because the leases will, will be signed. So we'll know when we expect openings, when we have meaningful growth in our revenue, um, and as we mentioned, high margin uh, royalty revenue um, will become a big part of our story in 2024. So I think that's if people are patient enough to wait till 2024, because <laughs> uh, not all investors are. Uh, we expect to continue our growth and uh, add into our portfolio. Hey, excellent. Well, I guess, uh, you know, one thing for me, uh, just speaking as a shareholder, um, you know, I, pre I appreciate all that. I guess a little bit more liquidity would be helpful just so that if people do say, hey, this isn't for me, I'd like to move on. Um, there's an orderly way for their shares to be uh, to be sold uh, without it sort of affecting the market on a percentage basis uh, so, so much. Yep. Um, you know, the company's kind of, uh, you know, goes up to 18 or 18, 19, 20, and then, you know, it's back down to, you know, sort of 15. It looks like obviously you've got lots of supporters there that are bid uh, quietly, uh, iceberg orders and things like that uh, from time to time, I've noticed. But uh, I guess just a little bit more sort of uh, regular sort of liquidity. So you have an orderly market would be one thing. In terms of valuation, well, I think it's really just going to be, you know, you guys continuing to. Uh, kind of uh, grow grow the business, uh, yeah. but I guess uh, selfishly, if there was uh, mm -hmm. something I've kind of mentioned before, it's just to see a little bit more sort of daily sort of uh, li liquidity so that it, um, you can absorb um, um, b both buyers and sellers a little bit more effectively. But, yeah, um, you know, I agree. Then you truly would then you truly would have a boring a boring stock. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and you know what um, that is that, and you know I'm not going to sit here and say. Like some, you know, I've heard guys say before, oh, no, I have no clue. I don't pay attention to the stock at all. I have no idea where my share price is. Well, that would actually scare me a little bit. You know what I mean? Sure. If, you know, uh, we've been focused on the float first because, uh, to your point, every time it's moved up, you know, I mean, sometimes somebody just dumps on your head. You know what I mean? And uh, so that's, yes. the, that's the cleanup, uh, that job that's been required longer and more painful than I ever thought. Yes. Um, but the good news is when I have friends that, you know, own a million, two million, three million or seven million shares now. Uh, and continue to buy in the float, and maybe those guys that are putting those icebergs there, that between 14 and 16, that continue to soak it up. Uh, I do get a lot of phone calls post the buy saying, 
this is awesome. I hope these guys keep selling to me. You know what I mean? And so, cause sometimes Great. we have a friend or somebody we know, and all I can tell you is, you know, hopefully um, they, they're going to the right hands and that will uh, make the tradable float. Um, if it is, you know, sub 30 million now, um, hopefully it'll get smaller and the, uh, and people want to pay for what's left. Well, that's excellent. Hey, Sean, really appreciate your time. I think that's a great way to sort of end, end it. And thanks for diving into all facets of the business. I wish you nothing but continued success. Um, obviously got a, a, a stake in a small stake in the business and I uh, love what you guys are doing and I uh, love seeing the news releases. It doesn't really matter what day you put them out on. Um, but, uh, uh, certainly very interested and intrigued with what you guys are doing. And it's nice to see, again, you guys know your business better than anybody and have expertise in both. But I guess uh, just from an investor standpoint, I'm, I really wanted a bit more focus on QSR because it's a theme that's sort of, you know, playing a little bit better in the in the sort of macro environment. And that, um, that is I, can our point to QS, I can point to a lot more QSR winners or and a large caps that are performing well. Uh, than I can on the CPG, pure CPG front. But anyways, you, again, you guys know your business better than than anybody. And and uh, um, it's an area it, you play in both sectors. But thanks very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.